Um, my name is Aaron Fabian. I'm the Deputy Director of, of Bibo College in Budapest, and I am a fellow at IASC, and uh, I am very happy to, to chair this um, slightly reduced panel. Unfortunately, one of our panelists had to drop out uh, last minute. Uh, nonetheless, uh, nonetheless uh, two of our panelists, sorry. Um, but nonetheless, we hope we have uh, a good discussion, and, and we hope to engage you um, in, in thinking about European values and um, and how we might find them and what sort of institutions uh, might be able to find those values. So uh, let me just briefly introduce our two uh, panelists today. Um, we have Sean Cleary, who bears no introduction after yesterday's um, lecture, but I'll just briefly run through his, uh, his uh, affiliations. He's the Chairman of Strategic Concepts, LTD, uh, Managing Director of the Center for Advanced Governance, Founder and Executive Vice Chair of the Future World Foundation, Chairman of Atlantic Holdings, LTD, and uh, member of the advisory board at IASC, and he lectures at a number of universities, if I may so brief. Um, uh, to my right is uh, my good friend, uh, Marta majeszewski nemat who is the director of Bibo College in Budapest and also a senior fellow at IASC, I think? Uh, no, not senior fellow. Just a regular uh, fellow, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Just a research fellow at, at IASC. Um, and uh, yeah, he's a socio-legal theorist at heart and political theorist, if, if I understood his research correctly over the years. <laughs> uh, he edited all my work. So. Yeah, okay, so um, our panel today um, will start with, with Sean's uh, brief uh, brief uh, presentation on, on certain institutional uh, arrangements and, and, and issues uh, related thereto. And afterwards, we hope to generate a bit more of a lively discussion with, with all of our participants. So, Sean, I am very happy to give the floor over to you. Thanks very much, Aaron. Much appreciate. And uh, I'm delighted to leave that here because nobody's going to believe that I'm ferry anyway. So. <laughs> and if I say anything that's too contentious, then I'll say ferry said it. <laughs> uh, I think the interesting thing about the present moment is that what we've managed to do over the little more than a day of discussion so far is delineate quite a lot about what's wrong, why it's not working, why there are problems, why global institutional frameworks are coming unstuck, why tectonic shifts, Nelly used the phrase earlier and I'm going to use it again myself, why tectonic shifts are taking place in the global architecture at the moment. But what we haven't managed to do, and we don't have any immediate prospect of doing, is thinking about what we ought to do about it. Now, the curious thing I mentioned yesterday, and I just want to draw your attention to it again. The curious thing is that since the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, the Secretary General at that time launched something called UN at 75 and beyond. Flowing from that, because a significant amount of what was intended to happen in the context of those programs was interrupted by COVID. And the degree of research of opinion among civil society groupings women, youth, and in addition to that, governments and various portions of governments. All of that was significantly interrupted. To save it, the Secretary General was asked by the General Assembly to write a report conceptualizing what might have come out of the entire inquiry, and that report was then called Our Common Agenda. You can find it anywhere online, there's no difficulty, just search our common agenda. Flowing from the report on our common agenda, which the General Assembly then accepted, there was then a high-level panel for effective multilateralism brought into existence. And that panel has produced a significant and quite interesting report. And since then, I think 17 policy issue briefs 
have been prepared by the Secretariat on the issues addressed in our common agenda and in the high-level panel's report. And this, theoretically, is all going into a summit of the future, which is going to be on the 22nd and the 23rd of September in New York this year. And flowing from that summit of the future, there is intended to be a pact for the future, which will be adopted in the General Assembly by 193 states. So you'd think everything's solved, wouldn't you? I mean, that sounds perfectly reasonable. It's a rational plan. Right? You start something on the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, you say, right, we have to make our institutions fit for purpose for the 21st century and capable of being flexible and adaptive on a continuing basis, let's do it. And then you go through the processes that, as Andre will tell you, are absolutely characteristic of the United Nations system. The Secretary General produces a report, the General Assembly accepts the report. The Secretary General is given a new brief, the Secretary General appoints a high-level advisory panel. The high-level advisory panel produces a significant report. This is reported back to the General Assembly. The General Assembly accepts that report. The Secretariat starts producing issue briefs. Co-chairs are appointed for the summit and co-chairs are appointed for the Pact for the Future and they've got on with their work in the meantime and it's all going swimmingly. And as I said to you, <laughs> He knows I'm being slightly facetious. You can all take it with a grain of salt. But that's broadly speaking what's happening and we're heading for September. And I encourage you again, as I encourage those of you who were present last night, engage. You can, in fact, make significant contributions to the Pact for the Future now. You can go online at any time from this moment and link up to that and start putting further proposals into it. To Jody's point last evening, if we are the sovereign people and if we are the global citizenry, we have an obligation to make some contribution at least to that process. As Andre once again will tell you, that will not necessarily be reflected in quite the way that you may as individuals have wished in respect to the final document, but at least you will have exercised your sovereign right and your collective or individual responsibility. But what we're trying to do is figure out how Europe fits into that whole frame. And this part of the discussion is about European values. And then that wonderful phrase that Joe Nye came up with when he was at Kennedy's school of soft power. You have to remember Joe Nye had previously been the Assistant Secretary for International Organizational Affairs at the US Department of Defense. So as a consequence, soft power was in direct contrast to hard power, and his underlying construct around the concept of soft power was that if you represented values that others aspired to and admired, then your power, your influence, your capacity was enhanced. And that was the logic of soft power. So, where are we? This is the leading meme on social media at the moment <laughs> in terms of the G7 meeting 13 to 15 June in Pasana. All right? Unelected Eurocrat on the left-hand side, just lost election next to him. 50-year low poll numbers, just lost election next to him. Too senile to stand trial, 26% approval rating, about to lose election, an unelected Eurocrat. <laughs> well, she was the one she was the one who was welcoming them. She's the one in the middle, as you can see, and nobody said anything rude about her at all. Now, I'm not saying to you for one second the purpose of putting that up is not to poke fun at G7 leaders. It's to show you what is happening on social media in respect of the powers that we've been talking about over the course of the last several days. And anyone who doesn't recognize that the G7 have significant impact on what happens in respect of security, the economy, and decisions that are taken about the commons doesn't understand how the world works under present circumstances. So that's the meme. But how fair is that meme? I'm just going to show you a few things. This is a little thing from London, 
which says that in the aftermath of the European Parliament elections, the specter of neo-fascism is haunting Europe. The detail doesn't matter, none of these are particularly good articles, but they come from serious sources. The next one came out of foreign policy and played on the Vienna balls on if Europe's lost, why not party? And the next one was left, right, march, Macron's snap election is boosting extreme parties. So, again, the journalistic memes are suggesting that Europe is in deep trouble at the moment. But what is the real situation? The real situation is that not all that much changed, but serious people, and these are rather more serious than the ones that I've shown you up to this point in time, are pretty sure that the election results are going to influence the agenda and legislation of the European Union over the next five years. The vote share of parties to the right of the EPP, and as you know, the EPP is the center-right grouping in the European Parliament, rose from 18% to just over 24% if the hard right parties that are currently sitting in the non-attached group are included. So there's been a slight increase. 18 to 24 was significant, but it's hardly tectonic. The EP election saw strong performance by populist right-wing and far-right parties in many EU countries. Why? It was propelled by opposition green policies, anti-migration sentiment, and economic insecurity. And nobody's done, to the best of my knowledge, a significant analysis about what played most heavily where, because polling hasn't been that granular in the aftermath of the elections. But collectively, we can say that in the context of austerity, in the aftermath of COVID, investments in green policies have been increasingly perceived to be too expensive to be justified under present circumstances, and migration is still a significant issue within Europe. That is the summary of the conclusions of that outcome. In this overall context, it looks as though Ursula von der Leyen is going to get another term, because number one, there's no one better, as far as anyone can see, and nobody wants to rock the boat too hard. Any form of prediction about the future is a mug's game, so I'm not telling you that that's a done deal, but that's certainly the way it looks under present circumstances. The detail for those who want to look carefully at what actually happened in the elections is represented in terms of the last elections in 2019 and the present ones in 2024 in the graphs on the right-hand side. You'll get the slides, so you don't need to worry about it now. Now, you almost all know what we're talking about in terms of the European Union, but I'm going to spend just a few minutes on it just to make quite sure we're talking about the same thing. Because we very frequently use phrases like Europe, and as everybody knows, Europe and the European Union are not quite the same thing. An awful lot of people outside of the space tend to think of the Eurozone and the European Union as somehow correlative. There are significant differences in respect to the numbers, 19 in the Eurozone and 27 in the European Union. And obviously, there are certain implications about being a member of the European Union. It's not about prestige. It's not just about compliance. You're actually, you have surrendered a certain degree of national sovereignty in pursuit of a larger set of benefits which are believed to be associated with membership. So, member states have agreed to share certain aspects of their sovereignty through the institutions of the Union. In some cases, membership of the Union requires unanimous agreement in the European Council for the adoption of certain policies. Very difficult. Lots of things don't happen as a consequence of that. Lots of things don't get taken to a vote as a consequence of that. And other collective decisions are made by qualified majority voting. And all of that is premised, in terms of the shared sovereignty, the provisions of the founding treaties are legally binding 
on all member states. So when a decision has been taken, even if you didn't like that decision, even if you had your arm twisted in order to accept it, or even in those circumstances where qualified majority voting was required, not unanimity, you are still bound by it. Now understand what that means. It means a significant surrender of sovereignty. We use the phrase national sovereignty or state sovereignty casually quite frequently, and we don't take into account the fact that membership, at least of the European Union, involves a significant, valuable, but significant derogation of sovereignty. The countervailing element within the European Union structures is subsidiarity. So decisions are only taken collectively if they can't be taken realistically or competently at lower levels. And the underlying principle of subsidiarity, which goes back to 1957, is embodied in the whole set of structures. You've heard tensions reflected in several of the panels today around the question of the commission bureaucrats thinking they're in charge telling, in effect, the politicians who are elected by someone along the way what they should do because they are the masters of the detail. And that's true. That's the first part of this particular tension. The second part of this tension is this issue of subsidiarity. And one of the largest debates over 20 years <coughs> in the European Union is what should be dealt with at what level. I don't know if you remember the jokes at the time of Thatcher versus Delors, you're too young, but you'll know it at least from history. Uh, the jokes were that the commission was trying to regulate the curvature of a banana that could be sold within markets in the European Union. Well, it, that wasn't quite true, but it was an excellent example where subsidiarity should have taken the issue off the table before the discussion started. Now, if you take this forward, and I'm deliberately showing you this because this is what led to Brexit. This was the set of considerations that took us from 28 down to 27. So here is the position in 2016. 28 member states, 4,325 square kilometers, greater than 508 million, 7.3% of global population, nominal GDP, 24% of global population. Tells you something about how successful the European Union had been. It's a hybrid intergovernmental and supranational decision-making system through a variety of institutions. The European Council, the Council of the European Union, the European Parliament, the European Commission, the Court of Justice, the European Central Bank, and the European Court of Auditors. Not all of those, specifically not the European Central Bank, apply to all 28 at this point, 27 now members but they are all entities through which member states of the European Union or of the Eurozone surrender a measure of sovereignty. There's an internal single market through a legal system that's applicable across all member states. As you all know, within the Schengen area, there are no passport controls. The aim is to ensure free movement of people, goods, services, and capital, enact legislation in justice and home affairs, and maintain common policies on trade, agriculture, fisheries, and regional development. The monetary union came into effect in 99, came into full force in 2002. We've said several times there are 19 member states using the euro. And the common foreign and security policy, which includes a common defense and security policy, also represents a constraint on sovereignty because at least in respect to the smaller states, the high representative for foreign and security policy overrides foreign ministers in many cases. You also probably know the original remark often attributed to Kissinger, who said, when I phone Europe, what number do I use? And part of the answer to that question was intended to be the high representative for foreign and security policy. Now that is contrasted
because of the difficulties that it's given rise to, and I don't have to tell anyone in Hungary how much tension the centralization of decision-making in Brussels has caused in respect of national politics in Hungary. Not only Hungary, but Hungary is a good example of that particular challenge. And part of the reason for that is that we lost sight, I mentioned this the other day, but I'm going to state it again, we lost sight around about 2005 of the implications of removing sovereign capacity also in respect of fiscal and monetary policy, but also in respect of security and defense policy, also in respect of foreign policy. We lost sight of the implications of that as we expanded <coughs> the European Union. At six, it was reasonably easy to have agreement on those issues. At nine, still okay. Twelve, mm, but okay. Fifteen, because the three who came in were southern European states in need of financial support for purposes of integration economically, and because the Union wished to celebrate the end of phalangism and right-wing politics in Portugal, relatively easy, same in respect of Greece, relatively easy. Ten to twenty, sorry, fifteen to twenty-five, an increase of ten in 2005, much more difficult. And the level of preparation probably wasn't sufficient. So the tensions expanded very considerably after 2005 because we now had 25 states, all of whom, in terms of the founding acts and related documents of the European Union, had sacrificed a measure of sovereignty, could no longer exercise full state sovereignty on an individual basis, and weren't necessarily, in their own minds, seeing more benefits than costs associated with their membership of the Union. So, Macron, on the 9th of May 2022, came up with a concept which he simply called the European Political Community. The first conference on the future of Europe, which launched this thing, was held, as I've said, on the 9th of May after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, why was it done? As uh, Monsieur Macron is not sitting here, uh, he won't contradict me. If some of you know better than I do what was going through his mind in the Elysee at that moment, I'll be delighted to be contradicted. But broadly speaking, what was happening was that for political reasons and security reasons, Ukraine was being pushed to the front of the queue for entry into the European Union. That was going to cause tension in respect of a number of other states who were in what Vesna Pesic called the courtyard or the waiting room for the European Union at that point in time. It wasn't clear that Ukraine was going to meet all of the requirements for admission to the European Union faster than these other states waiting in the courtyard. And so as a consequence, Macron said, eh, this is going to give us headaches going forward. Let's find a way of finessing it. And part of the discussion that took place around the creation of the European political community was the idea that as we hadn't quite resolved the tension between widening the community at 27 and deepening the integration of the community through these common instruments involving a sacrifice of sovereignty, Perhaps the political community could be a means of widening without having to deepen. And those of you who know the history of the development of the European community to European Union will know that there was a big debate in the late 1980s about how you were going to apply variable geometry and varying speed to allow for rapid integration among states that wish to do so without requiring all states to accept all responsibilities simultaneously. And this is, in a certain sense, the revisitation of variable geometry and varying speed. On the 29th of September, the original uh, group that had formed the European political community Russia and Belarus having been deliberately excluded. The UK had 
agreed to join. And at the time at which that was done, a statement was issued saying specifically that the EPC is a platform for political coordination that does not replace any existing organization structural process and does not aim to create any new organization structures or processes at this stage. The aim is to foster political dialogue and cooperation among countries that subscribe to our shared core values and find a new space for cooperation on politics, security, energy, infrastructure, investment, and migration, and to strengthen the stability, security, and prosperity of the European continent. It's got to the point now where it's at 47 countries. So the 44 that met in October 2022 saw three more, San Marino, Andorra, and Monaco, and there have been three conferences to date. Now, where does this go from here? We can see how this introduces an element of flexibility into the future development of Europe. And what's the purpose? Why are we doing this? Well, because it's an archetypal collective action challenge. Collective action is a situation in which all individuals would be better off cooperating, but some may fail to do so because of perceived conflicts of interest between individuals, communities, or states. That's, that's the essence of the problem. That's what Mr. Orban speaks about on a regular basis, and that is the central debate in respect of Europe. Farid Zakaria, and I'm not offering this to you as an authoritative statement, I'm offering it to you as a highly informed statement from the other side of the Atlantic, did a rather interesting article in the Washington Post on the 14th. He pointed out that in 2008, the US and Eurozone economies were the same size. But in 2024, the US economy was nearly twice the European economy. Average European income is 27% lower than the US, he said. Average wages are 37% lower. When the UK left the EU, they spoke of forging closer ties with the US if the EU became the 51st state, as it were. If they did, they would be the poorest state, with a GDP per capita below Mississippi. In global terms, US tech companies dominate. US banks are far more profitable. US energy production has lured many EU companies. And he quotes a German CFO, happens to be from Siemens, but it's neither here nor there, that America is a much easier place to do in business, has far fewer regulations and lower energy costs. How do I rationally invest in Europe? And he notes the Shell and Tortala considering listing on the New York Stock Exchange. You all know that both Enrico Letta and Mario Draghi are, have been tasked with preparing reports on policy to check the slide. Letters report is out, Draghi's is on the way, and both say that Europe is too divided. I'm not going to do the technology thing in great detail, but what he argues is that if you want to be successful in the digital spaces, you need great engineering talent, easy access to capital, and a large market. He says the US has got all three, so does China. Europe has highly talented engineers and capital, but is not a single market. Tech entrepreneurs must navigate 27 sets of regulations, authorities, and standards. And Letter has already noted that the EU has got 33 trillion euros of private savings, but 300 billion is diverted abroad each year to investments, most in the US. He then argues, I don't happen to agree with this thesis, but nonetheless he argues <coughs> that the geopolitical arena is equally challenging. He says there is a common foreign and security policy, but national divisions abound. Defense spending is rising, but too low. And he argues that most of the spending is directed towards national defense, which is largely irrelevant in the European context. He has a footnote on this, who wants to invade Belgium. And he then argues that it's necessary to, in fact, focus on where the threat comes from, which is the East, and he says, in effect, Europe has no capacity to be able to deal with that. Much EU defense spending is wasted due to poor coordination and no grand strategy. So <coughs> I'm going to leave you with two thoughts to kick the discussion off. The first one is the principles. Unity, equality, freedom, security, and solidarity. 
if you go and distill the core documents of what is now the European Union, that is what one seeks. The aims are to ensure liberty, democracy, and the rule of law, so says Article 6.1, and the legal pillars of the European communities, the common foreign security policy, and cooperation in justice and home affairs. So in principle, it fits together very well. These reinforce one another. The challenges are that the policy that the European communities have taken over the course of the past several years in providing regulatory leadership globally in respect of environment through the Green Deal, <coughs> in respect of technology and social media and AI regulation, are to some significant degree in tension with economic advancement. Because if you want to have that sort of regulatory leadership on a global scale, you better make sure that you've got those three things that Zakaria pointed to. Excellent technological capability, significant capital pools, and a highly integrated market in place. Otherwise, you're constrained. And then the third element of tension is once again what Mr. Macron a couple of years ago introduced as the construct of strategic autonomy in order to relieve Europe's dependence on a US dominated NATO. So in as much as Europe wishes to assert itself as a geostrategic or political military power, then the challenges in respect of economic capability become that much greater and regulatory leadership in respect of exercising constraints, not on the shape of a banana, but certainly in respect of what constitutes appropriate economic activity from one state to the next, pose significant challenges. And that's the tension. That, if you want to solve the problem, these are the challenges that you have to solve. I'm going to stop here for the moment. I'll throw something about the European elections in on the back end if we have time, but it's not terribly important at this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful and, and rather wide-ranging over, overview of, of, of European affairs as we are standing now. Um, I'm turning to Marty if he has any comments at this point. If, if not, I'm happy to further discussion. Um, um, just, just a few comments um, uh, because I'm more like a co-chair co or co-host of this uh, prepared talk show uh, after uh, this wonderful presentation, because now we we really need your active uh, participation. But what hit my eyes uh, and my ears, of course, uh, was about the shared core values of the European political community. And I may be a cultural relat uh, relativist, but I just I just started to think about. Uh, what are the core shared core values of this political community? Is it the political community? Because I don't think so that we can uh, we can speak about a unified European uh, political community community where we know uh, uh, um, when we are uh, speaking about shared core values what we are uh, speaking about. It's more like you know. Uh, when the, the, uh, one of the U.S. Supreme Court justices asked about what is porn, uh, uh, um, uh, the defendant's lawyer uh, uh, told him that you, you know it when you see it. So when you hear your uh, shared core values from different countries of the European political communities, do you think the same list of shared core values? I, I did research uh, in human rights theory, and I'm, I'm more like a, a social legal theorist uh, than a practical guy, uh, a, 
in terms of uh, my academic work, but I, I think we, we need to define what we mean on political community. Me, myself, uh, think uh, uh, an ideal political community uh, is, uh, is the model of Hannah Arendt. I know that uh, Professor Olai is in the room, so I, 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 I dare to uh, say my uh, uh, vision of Arendt's uh, model, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, I read all your work on Arendt, and uh, you're a better, uh, much better researcher. But my interpretation is that uh, what Jeremy Waldron's, uh, Waldron calls uh, the sketch of a, a Republican model of constitution is uh, is a place, a police, a, uh, where you you have the opportunity to speak and act and to appear in front of others. Uh, is this uh, European political community project a project where you can appear freely in front of others, where you can articulate your ideas? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it that political community? So, or or, or what? What? And and my next uh, next uh, um, comment. I'm sorry if I'm rambling through uh, my my messy uh, uh, thoughts uh, is linked with this. Uh, it's solidarity. I just listened to a podcast a couple of weeks ago where two Hungarian left-wing economists, Laszlo Andor and uh, Zoltan Pogacsa, who is like the children of, uh, of this uh, very institute, uh, uh, talked about uh, how COVID brought uh, solidarity into action uh, in the European Union after and after COVID we forgot about it. We forgot the importance of social security. Uh, we forgot again uh, about uh, the importance of social stability. So we, we always talk about good economy, the, uh, the Eurozone countries, uh, uh, problems, uh, uh, defense spend, uh, spend, uh, spendings, but we always forget about uh, always forget about the people of Europe. We always forget that yeah, we are becoming poorer and poorer. Z Zakaria uh, showed that in uh, his article in the Washington Post. But it seems to me that because of uh, of uh, of the of the opportunity uh, of U uh, European people to appear in front of uh, each other and to speak and share their uh, uh, their ideas, uh, we uh, uh, we we are not a political community because where there is no social uh, social stability, there is there is no further step to speak and act and share uh, uh, our ideas. So yeah, um, I, I just uh, uh, um, take my, took my uh, red uh, scarf on myself, so just imagine. Uh, but yeah, wh where are our shared core values? Where is, where is solidarity? Where is social stability? Where is the opportunity uh, to hear uh, each other's voices? And I think we we can. Co I'm, I'm sorry. Just a, just a, just a an, uh, uh, a quick co comment. We can uh, m uh, make fun of uh, uh, Bardella. Uh, I don't like him. He's a fascist. He's a kind fascist who who who's really good looking and he can speak very uh, very kindly. But he is uh, he's a symptom that. All the, the European elite forgot about uh, uh, the the very people of the European political community. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marty. Um, Ferenc has some comments. But I think uh, uh, Sean, if you have quick comment, but we can we can start then. Um, I'll, I'll run around with the microphone if that's okay. That's the, that's the easiest one. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very good that it, it comes from from 
from your generation, and because uh, you you were not witness of of the beginning, it was called the European Community the EC when um, you know eighty nine occurred, and when we had real European politicians like Mitterrand, and Kohl became a th sort of I mean he jumped into the wagon, he didn't want to he, he used the opportunity to unite two parts of Germany, but Mitterrand really believed in in this new concept of, and, and he was um, very much in agreement with, with, with Gorbachev to the European common village, common home. Now, it used to be a political community, and um, there was a, there was a bon mot, a kind of a, a joke, that uh, what, is, what is the European community for, for the French, or the EU for the French? No. Um, have, you, have you heard this? The continuation of France with other means. But, but so it is in Statun Ascendi, and I think there was a, 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 a boom up until 2004, and there was a crisis as well described by Sean and many others, and then there's this kind of a stagnation and, 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 and um, uncertainty, ups and downs, but it is, it is a community, a political community in Statun Ascendi, and I think it was um, uh, Macron's uh, wit. It's the Gallic wit to formulate it that way that all those who are aspiring to become the, a, a member of this larger community, they should not feel excluded, humiliated, played down. Hmm? And that is the only, and, but it's a very important innovation in this political community, in my eyes, that these 50 heads of the states, the smallest one including, feel equal. There is no Copenhagen criteria in, in whatever, yeah? In maybe, and this is a question to Sean and to all of you, maybe it's still it is just, um, just blowing hot air. That's very, very many people say that it's nothing, it's just a blah, blah. Maybe not. So um, in this kind of um, difficult, dangerous times, yeah, I think to have a larger meeting place, a platform, is not a bad idea. But it, you are right, it's not yet a complete community, but it might become, maybe because of the, this, this, all of these dangers and, and pressures from, from outside, and maybe because some of these 500 million or more people feel more solidarity than less. And this is, this is something which we need to research, which we should maybe promote, and, and first of all, discuss. Thank you so much. Um, any comments from our panelists or? Yeah. Let, 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 let it run. Let it run, okay. Yeah, um, so I don't know which of you want to go first. Uh, I'll go with Jodie then, okay? <laughs> Um, we had a discussion about this at the winter school this year, and there was a lot of criticism of it because they thought it was very disingenuous, especially when related to um, the Balkans. So instead of allowing you know, their, their a session to go forward, they just kept in a nicer, maybe broader waiting room. Now, um, I also don't agree with Feli that it is not, um, they are not meeting on an equal basis there. They are, they are not equal partners in, in this um, your, um, political community. And so that's why I think we need to get back to Marcy's question about what common values do we share? I mean, how can we build solidarity among this broader group when we don't even have it among, among the 27? You know, I think that, you know, uh, mutual threats are one way of bringing uh, diverse groups together, but that's not enough, you know, and I mean, and that's only pretty much at the political military level and not at the level of societies. So I, I think a lot of work has to be done there and we had to take, have to take this with a grain of salt. Thank you. Um, I'll pass you, Ambassador Erdős. Coming back to the beginning of your explanation, Sean, uh, you spoke about the sacrifice of sovereignty, a dreadful feeling of sovereignty. Uh, let me just uh, go back to the one and only universal organization that we have, which is called the United Nations. In the charter, there is a specific um, uh, sentence 
saying, and we should know that the charter is a legally binding document. This sentence says, if there is a contradiction between agreements, uh, deals done bilaterally among different countries, and the charter of the United Nations, the charter prevails. So people are knocking on the doors. Every country that becomes independent, which is recognized by the international community, wants to become a member of the United Nations on these conditions. And they do not commit suicide. They actually enter. It is then true that the governmental policy always overtakes certain initial aims or perceptions and this governmental policy continues as long as the United Nations exists and I hope it will be coming it will come it will continue very very long with all the difficulties and and um, craziness even if, uh, if we, can, we can we can imagine if you imagine uh, a, a scenario in which the uh, actual president of the General Assembly turns to the audience, to the member states, and say, those who represent a democracy should please st stay up, stand up. And you will see the whole General Assembly enthusiastically standing up. This is a governmental policy that influences the behavior of the countries. But having said that, the uh, such a sovereignty is not something that is uh, that, that's it's some kind of, of a poison to the to the independence of the country. And I'm saying all this because where I live, unfortunately, I hear very often these kind of rhetorics. Um, and I absolutely agree with the two earlier speakers about the utility and the purposefulness of this uh, political community. With, for, with all the arguments that were presented, it is very, very important to go beyond the EU and assemble everybody. Let's talk, let's agree, let's see where we can make a move, especially after the uh, description of the many, many failures and, and errors that are committed by the European Union, by the way, by the United Nations. Uh, this is a fact of life and we should also appreciate efforts that are to that, that try to mobilize everyone in our wider re, uh, region uh, neighborhood and and uh, try to, uh, and work together even if not everybody is is a member of the European Union but at least this is a good step in the right direction we'll see how all this will end but i hope it will continue yes an anticipatory concept no no i'm just Thank you. I'm from Northern Macedonia. Uh, congratulations for your excellent report, Mr. Sean. My question is, what the Western Balkan country can receive from this political community? Because for one part of people, this is some excuse for stopped the enlargement. For second is le foire de la, demo de la diplomacy. Don't. Uh, I have another uh, remark. Uh, I'm not sure then uh, Bardella is fascist. If it's necessary be French uh, people to, to understand the position of Bardella. Bardella was formed by Macron because the French people think then for seven years, every time they have the same problems, agriculture problems, uh, the, problem, uh, the problems of, uh, of inflation, the problems of uh, some uh, centralization of power without any, any uh, respect of uh, public opinion. He was now, uh, 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 he's, now he's only in attitude, he, he haven't any, uh, uh, he haven't any uh, po political uh, communication with former uh, former uh, friends. Uh, Prime Minister, he said, 
please don't take uh, la parole, don't speak with people because if after every your uh, intervention, our popularity popularity go down. Uh, for this, but Bardella, I'm not sure uh, he may maybe he has he has some dimension of fascism. I don't know, but uh, he start to be uh, ed more educated, more uh, comprehensible for the French people. French people probably have some uh, some uh, resolution. Excuse me, thank you. Yeah. Just a couple of framing thoughts. Um, first of all, I think you're right. And that doesn't mean that uh, there is no community, and it doesn't mean that there is no care for the opportunities, the welfare of the individual citizen. But the moment that you try to organize things at scale, you necessarily lose the ability to be responsive to domestic circumstance. Uh, there are two responses. Uh, Emmanuel Macron said an enarch. Eh? And the second thing, and I'm not saying that nastily, I actually like him as a person, but I'm not saying it nastily. I'm just saying he thinks in solving problems. He doesn't necessarily think in terms of relating strongly to people. It's part of his personality in a meaningful way. And secondly, he doesn't have the institutional capacity because he broke the parties. So as a result of that, the LEC is not connected to the communes and the département in the same way that historically parties have been in France. But the, the challenge, everything that you said, you could actually say about the United States today, and that's only one country. There's no sacrifice of sovereignty. There's no commingling of 27. But there is a huge disjunction between power and the people. So I think we must be careful when we're looking at this particular challenge not to conflate all elements in the same way. If you're going to sacrifice sovereignty in the formal sense that you are granted it by the Charter of the United Nations and then you choose to come together in the context of the six and then the nine and then the 12 and then the 15 and then the 25 and eventually whatever, there must be more benefits than costs. If there aren't, it doesn't make any sense to do it. <coughs> One of the problems <coughs> associated with creating larger structures <coughs> is that power is further removed from the people. The reason for the logic of subsidiarity is that you want decisions to be taken as close as possible to the people who are going to be affected by those particular positions. The further you move away from that, the less likely it is that you're going to be able to make decisions that work to the benefit of the people who are most directly affected by it. And that's a problem of scale. Right? If any one of us, any two of us, sit down together and have a discussion, unless one of us is completely mad, we'll probably be able to reach a high degree of agreement on most things quite quickly. But if you try to reach agreement among 140 people in one room at one time, and you want formulation of a particular issue, and you want it to have a positive impact on the lives of those 140 people, it's very difficult. <laughs> so scale is a difficult thing. And engineering this constitutionally and in terms of legislation and regulation, so that the benefits outweigh the cost, is very difficult. There's nothing simple about it at all. So, but what I really liked about what you said, in terms of kicking this thing off, is this is premised on the idea that Europe represents values that the rest of the world looks up to. 
that somehow other states, even if they are more powerful economically or in security terms, are somehow deficient relative to the values that Europe represents. That's why the word soft power, I think, was stuck into this particular panel's framing. And if that isn't working, if that soft power in this way in which Joe Nye intended it, something that creates something to which other people aspire, if that's not working, then Europe's got a problem, just to be provocative. Um, I'm sorry, I, I came uh, with Bardella as an ex example. I could take, uh, I could, I, I could, uh, uh, to, I could take um, uh, uh, the AfD leaders or other far right wing uh, politicians. O although I think it's not so. Of course, they're. It is their fault that they are extremists, but. It's it, really it is the fault I think uh, the mainstream leaders of Europe that they they forgot to articulate problems uh, they forgot to form narratives which can be per persuasive for uh, their uh, uh, constituency. So why why do wh why is Bardella or I have the uh, the solution for the Ger German or the French people? Why not? Uh, okay, we don't like the SPD's uh, government. We turn to uh, 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 other mainstream parties. Uh, now it's not a good example because they are turning out to uh, the Christian Democrats. But in French, in France, it's a good uh, example, I guess. But uh, I, I'd like to hear uh, voices from younger generation. Please. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I do think I belong to the younger generation here. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, I think so far throughout the panels, we mostly heard, or at least that's what I took from the conversation, is that... Oh, yes. Um, my name is Anna Slovacek, and I'm from Bibo, and I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very happy to have heard these amazing um, presentations today. And what I basically took from today's conversations um, is that I feel like the EU is in a very big identity crisis. And I think this can also be said based on the last election results. And this is incredibly alarming because what this shows to me is that if people vote to extremist parties, this means that they essentially lost faith in all the other parties. And that they, this means and this signals to me that they're doing something incredibly bad. And I think. What has also been um, said throughout today's discussion is that um, essentially I think so far there has been a common understanding in Europe um, on what our common values are, or at least like they were named. And Sean also said these, the principles, unity, equality, freedom, security and solidarity, and the aims are liberty, democracy and the rule of law. But what I feel like is that essentially um, what has shifted is that ev that the member states um, and also leaders in this community are sort of starting to forget about these. And I think this is really alarming because um, when a member state or when a state decides to join the European Union, they're essentially accepting these set of rules. So in order to get the price, in order to benefit, you need to play by the rules, right? But I think what's happening is that basically most of these member states, and I can say Hungary, for example, they're starting to question the legitimacy of these principles. And I think that is very alarming because without the set of these core values, we can't really find common ground. Like the main slogan for Europe is that we're united in diversity, right? And we have diversity and diversity is a cool thing. And I think that's, that's amazing. But without the united part, we're not going to get anywhere. So I think my main question would be, how do we define these core values and how do we get back to defining these fundamental principles? Because without those, I don't, I don't really see a future where we can deal with all of the external um, challenges that are ahead of us. Yeah. 
Thank you. If you allow me to continue a little bit on the discussion of the generational difference. Um, maybe we forget why the EU was created, and there was the uh, first world Balkan Wars, first and second world wars, and big uh, misunderstandings between the countries in Europe. And what we did, not we, but the previous generations, succeeded to cooperate and to create the European Union for the purpose of having peace together. So it was uh, steel and coal community in the beginning, just economic uh, cooperation, and now we have political cooperation in the EU. At the current moment, the life in the European Union is relatively easy. It's very easy to travel, to communicate with other people, to find a job in another country if you wish, to move as much as you want. It's easy, but when people have easy life, they forget about the difficulties. Not long ago, I spoke with a person, 70, five years old in Bulgaria. And the story I, I got was, we were waiting with my husband for 20, not 20, but 15 years to get a car, right? And now you want a car, you go and you buy a car. We have a very easy life. You, we should focus on the, the way how to protect and how to have our good life in the European Union and how the countries who still are not in to also have the good life. And instead of this, you're asking about what are the core values. Maybe you have a very easy life, and that's why you forget about the difficulties, and you start asking yourself, do I define myself as a, uh, like, what is my problem? There is no problem. You have a good life, probably. Thank you. Okay, any further comments, questions from the audience? If not, I'll, I'll pass over to our panelists. But first, I want to add uh, a sort of provocative question of myself. Um, you've mentioned, um, EU regulation and regulatory approaches. Isn't it sort of um, a part of, our, of EU soft power? So if we think of, well, what are the core e European values and what are the you know, values we want to project to the world, as if we were one of the si shining cities on the hill, to, to use the American metaphor uh, for this, um, isn't like the importance of privacy tech regulation, aren't those things, or green transition regulation, aren't those things which might slow down the EU economy in these areas, but certainly signal the sort of, the entrenchment of these values. So might not those be instruments of soft policy? That's what I would ask. I think, <coughs> I think you've described the rationale behind it extremely well. I think that's uh, the, the argument that would be made in Brussels and is made in Brussels on several occasions, both in political circles and in the Commission itself, is that by prioritizing certain values above mere economic performance, Europe distinguishes itself in a meaningful way and set standards that are consistent with its core values. Uh, that, of course, doesn't get us past the question of saying, what are these core values and do we, in fact, live them out? But that's exactly the argument that's used, and that is one of the core strengths, unquestionably, um, of the European Union in dialogue. For example, at COP26, COP27, COP28, just to take the last three, the European Union was unchallenged across the whole of that particular uh, dialogue as the standard setter in respect of green transition. And other people were either seeking to justify why they couldn't go that far or alternatively questioning whether it was desirable in economic terms or necessary in respect of the science. Nobody was challenging the primacy of EU values in that regard. The problem is when that debate becomes internalized in the country. In other words, when you're leveraging it for diplomatic purposes externally, that's one thing. When you're starting to do the trade-offs within the community or within a national society between these elements, then it becomes more complicated. And <coughs> You know, the Center for European Policy Studies is a pretty mainstream Brussels-based analytical frame. So when Charles Grant and others come up with that report that I showed at the beginning, uh, I'm inclined not to second-guess it too much. Um, 
So my basic approach to that is what they were saying was their conclusion based on the analysis was that this combination of economic constraint, the cost of the Green Deal and related areas and concerns about migration, that triangulation had produced the rise in support for right-wing parties. And that's probably true. I mean, it, it, it rings broadly true uh, as, as a generalized frame. I, in, individuals will obviously have been motivated by particular considerations in each case. But it rings true. The, all, all that one's really saying, I think, in respect of all of this, is you've got to think very carefully <coughs> about how you handle the trade-offs. The reason I did those funny red triangles <coughs> is just to show you that if you get it right, the elements become mutually reinforcing. If you get it wrong, they become constraining. <coughs> and then the costs and the benefits frequently become misaligned and you have difficulty sustaining the position. I come back to the point exactly the same can be said about the United States today. The reason why Mr. Biden, <coughs> having broadly speaking, managed the economy with considerable skill. Janet Yellen is the primary person who deserves the credit for that. But having managed the economy with considerable skill, the reason why he is running in the seven swing states behind somebody who has got 43 felony charges against him is precisely the reason <laughs> that several of you have described. This sense that the the technocrats, for want of a better phrase, are not in touch with the aspirations of the people. That's the core problem. Unless you can close that circle, it really doesn't matter whether the problem is in Europe or whether the problem is in the United States. Unless you can close that circle, representative democracy is in big trouble. Right? And that's the core, I think, of this particular problem. So <coughs> I, I think this is less a problem of scale and more a problem of style. But I think one's got to recognize that the larger the scale, the more difficult it is to communicate individually effectively and be seen to be doing so. Do you want to respond? Uh, just a quick com comment, and thank you. I totally agree uh, with you uh, on that. Uh, it, it's um, uh, going to be more like a book recommendation. Uh, last week, I just read uh, quickly Wendy Brown's uh, last two uh, books. Uh, one of it is The Nihilistic Times, and the other is Undoing Demos. Uh, they were published uh, um, during the last couple of years, and she she thinks she writes about she writes mostly about the the American society the uh, the, uh, the society of the U.S. But she she thinks that uh, neoliberalism un uh, undid the demos and then made us nihilistic, uh, made us to think that we have a good life and we don't have to uh, deal with core values, we have to deal with identities and every, uh, every other uh, uh, um, um, issues. So uh, I really recommend this. Uh, mo uh, so read Wendy Brown. Thank you, and uh, I'm 100% agree with you, but I'm, I'm just thinking about something that we are in this room, we have shared values, mostly, uh, mostly 99%, but do we really represent the society? So we are thinking about values, but this, is, this group is here, doesn't even have anyone who, who, know, who, who doesn't know what are the values, but the population, let's say in Hungary, when they go to vote or f to the election, do they really know what are the core values, but the thing we are talking about here. So we are not representing the society and those who are not even thinking about values in this room. So I'm always just thinking about, is anyone of us out of this group, should I say this? N not, not the best term, maybe. So just to add something. Thank you. Let, let me yeah. tell you something. <coughs> this is just, uh, this is purely it's the product of something that I did about 10 years ago. And 
at a series of meetings from 2005 through 2007 across Europe in this period of significant expansion. I was interested in this question. Are there shared values? Uh, what, why, why do we get these strange things that everyone outside of the European Union seeking to get in thinks their welfare will increase highly significantly once they're in, but the countries that are in the European Union are dissatisfied with what the European Union is giving them. Why is this happening? And so I started using a decision optimization tool. It's not terribly important, but I started using it in interviews at major meetings. A lot of them were World Economic Forum meetings, but there were other uh, related issues. Elites, to, entirely to your point, which is why I'm telling the story now. People who knew the answers, at least in principle, in respect of any question that you were going to ask them. And so what I did simply is I said, tell me the top five values that constitute the European Union from your perspective, right? Let's merely say that I got a very wide range of answers to that question, an extremely wide range, certainly not the ones I had on those uh, triangular bar charts a little bit earlier. In addition to that, I then said to each one of them, we did about probably 15 interviews a day, over three, four days at each one of these meetings, and I said, tell me how this value relates to that value. Is it plus five, plus four, plus three, plus two? No particular relationship, minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five, right? And this enables you to create a rather interesting three-dimensional diagram which you can then locate in space and produce very different configurations. I can assure you that there was almost, I exaggerate now with what I'm saying, but there was almost no similarity. If you had projected those particular images on top of one another, you would have found very low correlations. What we did find was significant correlations on national levels. So German technocrats tended to have much the same sort of view of what the European Union was. New entrants, in terms of the 10 who had come in in 2005, tended to have aspirational descriptions in respect to the values that they associated with it. So you had established patterns, but if you looked at it across the entirety of the scale, there was almost no correlation. And since then, quite frankly, I mean, Ferry's heard me a hundred times cite 2005 as the turning point. <clears throat> but since then, I've been skeptical about the ability to be able to manage coherence in a, in a constructive way. Just going back to your question, is Hungary a political community? Maybe a soccer, a football community. Yeah, see? Yeah, so the, 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 yeah, I agree, I completely agree with you that we need to rethink and redefine these notions, but I think yours is a little closed one, and what Macron believes, and some, some of us, is that you have to put things into motion, in motion, and, and anticipate, and give a chance to others. I think it's psychologically very important for small st states like Northern Macedonia, whoever is there, to, to participate on an equal basis and discuss things. Mm -hmm you know, informally. And this is the bill. Maybe it does not work. I heard more criticism about the European political community than, than, than praise. I mean, people, what is this? But what is the European Union? Okay, we don't start again, we had a lot of, but you know, it's not approachable for, for those who are not yet, who are excluded. Waiting, or those even who, who are accepted uh, to, to start the negotiations are, are, fe are feeling completely humiliated and the Serbs had enough. 10 or 15 years ago they were pro. And now go back to Hungary. I'm not, I don't completely agree with you, Kati, that people maybe cannot, ex cannot express themselves like, you know, in political scientific terms, but I think they have a hunch about, about values. 80%, 70-80% of Hungarians believe that it's better to, to be a member state of the European Union than against all the whatever you call populist and blah, 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 
uh, rhetoric, which they also kind of appreciate because this is uh, like you can't mondja meg senki, so we, uh, but at the same time they want they want to remain. Yeah, okay, Judy. to make a short comment. Yeah, I mean, they, they might not articulate it as values, Kati, but they have feelings and they have intuitions. And uh, I think a lot of uh, actually what's motivating, um, you know, Trump space in the, in the U.S. is not based on shared values with Trump. That's for sure. It's, it's clear. But they have this emotional uh, response to being, you know, left outside, left out of of globalization, of the benefits, you know, and that's where I see the real danger is in this increasing, um, you know, economic inequality, which which has just incredible ramifications for uh, your opportunities, your educational opportunities, your your work life, your family life, everything, your professional opportunities. So it's a feeling, uh, and I think that they uh, they have legitimate feelings that in our maybe intellectual circle we would call it values or core values, but they do share. They do share those feelings. Just a short comment. And besides, the, our whole life is more, as someone said at the beginning, maybe Sean, I don't know, that we have more emotions yeah. and sentiments than rational conceptions. So we are, but we are a mixture of this, though. It's very... Baba. And it's, but this is, the, but this is, this is, this is true. And this is why sovereignty is important because people, the more they hear it, they, they kind of feel better that we are sovereign. Uh, but that's not really taken seriously in, in strict or sense of political terms. They want to belong to a larger umbrella like Hungarians called the European Union because they feel more safe and completely agree with Sean's basic concept. Um, the fear and the want. The fear of the war, fear of whatever, collapse and, 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 and lust or greed. That r runs, you know, human societies. But they must have something else. And this, is, this is why I think, I believe that we, we have to have, we have to elaborate um, uh, concepts which not yet, we are not yet realized. But, but has a, they have a potential. A European political community against the, all of the odds does have a potential, and that is kind of important. Let me just yeah. hold on that for one second, <coughs> because the one thing we haven't really responded to was Nelly's point earlier about why this thing was created back then. What was Monet trying to do? Why? And Therefore, how does that relate to where we are today? And it, uh, the reason I'm doing it is because you went back to the sort of triadic biochemical <laughs> circumstance that drives all living organisms that uh, proceed through evolution. The reason that it was created was to try and prevent another war. Right. It had been catastrophic. Right. France and Germany, that was Monet's frame, had destroyed one another. Germany had obviously done it to France. It wasn't France doing it to Germany. And therefore he came up with a terribly simple concept, unite the coal and steel industries so that anything <coughs> that may go toward the construction of a military industrial complex, as we might choose to say today, will be shared. Because if we put it together in that way, the risk is highly significantly reduced. And that's the origin. It was as simple as that. It was fear. It was, let's try and prevent this happening again. But you see, what happens among humans is that as you overcome the fear, the want becomes more important. If you lived with amygdala stimulation all the time, with cortisol flowing into your system and adrenaline flowing into your system, you couldn't possibly sit still in a chair. <coughs> you would be killing the person next to you, or you'd be running, or you'd be jerking around in some sort of remarkable way, <coughs> and all the males would have very large beer bellies. 
right? Because that's what cortisol does. So under all of those circumstances, <coughs> we try to avoid fear. We try to create circumstances in which we feel more comfortable. <coughs> and that's the aspirational part. Once you've stopped the fear, you start trying to design to meet the want. And as the European Union was not designed to enable human procreation, lust wasn't the issue. <coughs> so as a consequence, <coughs> as a consequence, greed, if you will, accumulation, the ability to grow the economy became the overarching logic. And the single market was the creation of a large market with largely shared regulation that would allow for a significant increase in respect of economic opportunity. That was the logic behind it. We, we behave the same way all the time. Humans can't actually do anything very different. It's just that we tend to push it to a limit where it becomes dysfunctional. And I think it's fair to say that those who have driven the system over the last 10 or 15 years have lost touch with what the system is supposed to do for the citizenry. And that's almost inevitable in bureaucratic structures. It's almost inevitable at large scales. But it's something that Europe is going to have to fix if it wants to play the sort of role that I think it aspires to in respect of a reconfigured global community. You are going to, we are, you are, going to have to be more responsive to the needs of the citizenry at scales that work. And whether you can do it across 27 significantly different societies simultaneously with one set of policies is not clear to me. And that's, that's what we're going to have to grapple with going forward. Yeah, just, <coughs> just a quick uh, answer to uh, Professor Mislavets. I don't think that the idea of initiating a European political community uh, is bad. I, I think that now it, 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 is, it, it is one of Macron's uh, well-sounding or good uh, uh, slogans. Renew Europe, European political community, uh, and all the others. And, bec and uh, what I'm trying to say uh, is that we cannot avoid doing that work, uh, answering meta questions, uh, what the founding fathers of, of the EU did. So, yeah. Yeah, we, unfortunately, our time has run out. So, uh, thank you, Tal. Okay, yeah. Last but not the least. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, a lot of issues actually to discuss, but I will try to to focus on some points. Um, actually, the idea as a project is uh, maybe good, but I don't. I, I hope that one day we will make one sort of analysis, so what uh, strengthening weakness, opportunity, and threats, because the idea is generally okay, but we have a lot of threats. I think. Uh, in this idea, as our young colleague said, uh, unity and the in diversity. I think that the uh, European Union actually missed the issue of diversity, not in in European Union, but in a uh, neighboring countries' diversity, actually. Uh, and uh, when we're talking about the values, I think that uh, the Western Europeans are still not uh, prepared to to accept that in the Balkans and in Turkey, it's a Muslim population <laughs> living. Because generally, the values, general main pillar of the European Union is uh, the Christianity, Catholic Christianity. Yeah, the main pillar, actually. <laughs> but when we're talking about now the Eastern country, except for Bulgaria and uh, Romania, we don't have any Orthodox countries. Greece is... Another Orthodox is not the Slavic Orthodox. Russia, 
<laughs> Russia and so on. But uh, and generally in the Balkans, actually in you know, Turkey, I, we are saying that the uh, European Union actually it's a club of the Christians. It's not the, the, the club of values. And uh, also I think that uh, one of the main um, obstacles when it was in Lisbon, uh, the constitution of Europe was should we put in the constitution of Europe that Islam religion is equal religion with the Christianity. Actually, that was one of, I think, that the, of the point. That, uh, we had. And finally, we were very solid, all the European, we are talking about values, about um, condemning the genocide in Srebrenica. But very weak European countries condemned the genocide in Gaza one month ago, actually. <laughs> Even now, only Slovenia, Nor Norway, and, uh, and Spain actually recognize the Palestina where we are talking about human rights and values and so on, we also have to, to see where are we staying in the scale of the human rights if we are not condemning the genocide in Gaza and Palestine and not condemning the, not recognizing also the, as we are talking about Kosovo, we have to talk about the Palestine also, if you are talking about uh, human rights values. Uh, thank you. Yeah, the question <laughs> of consensus also. Yes. <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have plenty of opportunity to continue the discussion. That's one of the advantages of the uh, format of this summer school. So thank you so much to all of you who participated in the discussion. And thank you so much to our panelists, Sean Cleary and Marta Matyashoskinimat. And now, so culture. Yeah. <laughs>